this news, honey cycle road. I will call to order the Park and Recreation Commission meeting for January 27th. Um, we will stand for the pledge. Ready, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and we'll have roll call, Ms. McGill. Chair Longstreet? Here. Larimore Hall? Here. Burns? Here. Case Beer? Here. Connor? Here. Wiscombe? Here. Hawkman is not present, and intern Torres Santos is not present. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two new commissioners with us tonight, and um, I would like to ask them to introduce themselves, and maybe if you want to say a few words, so... Um, Commissioner Whitcomb. Yes, my name is Leslie Wiscombe, and I'm uh, pleased to be a uh, commissioner on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, my background is in landscape architecture. I'm a licensed landscape architect uh, coming from the state of Washington, and uh, my career in landscape architecture is, was dedicated to public work, designing parks and uh, recreation spaces and uh, civic spaces. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, and we appreciate your expertise. Thank you very much. And Mr. Casebeer. I'm Chris Casebeer, and I'm a local realtor for over 30 years, so I have a pretty good feeling for Santa Barbara as a community. I've been in most every park there is. I am also an avid cyclist and a former volleyball player, so I have been in lots of the um, recreation facilities over the years. And I, too, am looking forward to working with everyone here. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to having both of you on the commission. Um, thank you very much for devoting your time to this. And we welcome back... Um, Ms. Connor, who's filling in for us through uh, the next appointment process, we feel. So thank you for stepping up to that. It's a pleasure. Okay. Do we have any changes to the agenda, Ms. Rupp? No, Chair Longstreet. Okay. Written communications? None. Public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to one minute on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. Is there anyone here for public comment? And at this time I'd, take, I'd remind people, if you're here for an agenda item, to please fill out one of the forms in the back and make sure to note the agenda item in the upper corner. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have any community service recognitions this month. Do we, Ms. Rapp? Uh, no, we no. do not. Okay. Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports. Anyone have any reports to give? I know you must, Mr. Burns. You know, you know I, I do, but generally I write them down, but uh, let's go. I, Santos uh, with the Youth Council is not here, and generally he would talk on what's going on with the Youth Council. They um, met about a week ago at the um, Victoria Center as part of their outreach program to not just meet here, uh, but meet in other locations. Uh, they approved the... Um, uh, the, and I've got it written down here. We're going to talk Not about down it our agenda, the ordinance. The ordinance that got, that got approved and other items are going forward with the Youth Council. The um, Park Foundation uh, met a week ago Wednesday. Park Foundation is starting a uh, fundraising program, Friends of the Park. Uh, as part of it, they're going to have a, uh, a party on the Condor Express uh, the end of April. We're looking for attendees, so anyone who wants to call me through the park office, I'm sure I can, they will get you an invitation. Uh, park Foundation Arts and Craft Show uh, met two weeks ago, approximately, and we're meeting again next Tuesday. And the uh, um, Arts and Craft Show is... Uh, has a couple of issues that they're trying to get resolved, and hopefully we'll get those resolved in the next couple of uh, months. That's, Thank you. That's all I have. 
Anybody else? Um, I attended the Golf Advisory Committee meeting and they are um, looking forward to the completion of the projects that they have going out at the golf course. Um, they're still struggling a bit with revenues and I think the rain probably isn't going to be helping that, but um, everyone's looking forward to the completion of that project and I'd encourage all the commissioners when that is done and they have a grand opening to attend because it's going to be a really interesting project. Um, also, the Douglas Family Preserve has some planting days coming up, so look for information on that. I believe January 30th is the planting day, so um, volunteers are all welcome. You should sign up ahead of time, though. All right, that brings us to, well, Youth Council report. Um, our intern is not here, so we'll move to the consent calendar. Uh, does anyone have any questions on the consent calendar from Council? Okay, seeing none, we'll have approval of minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes for December 3rd and December 16th? Um, Moved. Uh, would you mind bifurcating that motion? Okay, you... that would be fine. Okay, so we'll start with December 3rd. A motion for that. Motion for uh, December. Moving for motion for December 3rd. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, December 16th. Uh, moving for motion to, for approval of minutes of December 16th. Okay. Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And I, one abstention. One abstention. Okay. All right. That brings us to street tree items. Mr. Downey. We have kind of a light month this month with only one item on it. Good afternoon, Chair Longstreet and Commissioners. Um, we have one item on the uh, street tree um, list. This is 3003 Paseo Tranquillo. The trees are actually located on Lugar del Consuelo side of the property. Um, this was reviewed last month by uh, this commission um, and the commission wanted to get an opportunity to take another look at the trees before a decision was made. Um, the trees on the slide here are in the order if you were standing across the street looking at them. Um, the uh, reason that the applicant main reason the applicant wanted to remove these trees was due to trip hazards that the roots were creating, especially the private walkway leading to the front door uh, has been lifted a short time after it was installed. When the Street Tree Advisor Committee uh, visited the site, uh, the owner came out and had a discussion with me about the trees. I explained some root pruning uh, possibilities for uh, uh, decreasing the chances the the walkway would continue to be lifted um, and uh, the street tree advisor committee uh, looked at the trees and determined that the tree on your right in the photo here um, is placed in the wrong location um, it's right up against the curb uh, as it grows it'll overlap that curb they determined that it would likely be appropriate to remove that tree um, they disagree with the reasons uh, stated to remove the other trees. Uh, staff's recommendation as well as street advisor committee is to approve the one tree closest to the corner uh, and deny the other two. Okay, thank you, Mr. Danny. We have a speaker for this, uh, Peggy Walls. Yes, I'm the homeowner and um, I, as I explained last time when I was here, um, we thought, well, we'll just plant the three trees. We don't need to take out all three trees. We already have planted two other trees, well, three other trees on our property. We love trees as well. And the tree that, you know, you're willing to let us take out doesn't solve the real main issue. I would really like to have one tree out, and the only tree I'd like to have out is the one that is right next to our walkway because it is, it has raised the walkway and it is now, you know, as I showed you, an inch to an inch and a half, to, yeah, as the slope goes. 
and so we have a, an issue with the trip, and it's just going to continue to get worse. I was told that we could, you know, possibly trim the roots, which, you know, would be a, a possibility, but that that's not going to stop it. So I would really ask you to consider letting us take that tree out, and I'm more than happy to plant another tree in that walkway, but just 10 feet away from, you know, in the, in the setback there, just 10 feet away from there, um, so that it, it won't continue to destroy our walkway. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It is back to the commission now. Um, yes, Ms. Wiscom. Um, I did look at the trees, and, and I, I um, concur with um, the Street Tree Advisory Committee and staff to remove the tree at the corner. I think it, 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 um, it is very poorly located and, and could, be a, um, could be an obstacle to vehicles in the future as it grows, etc. cetera. Um, I also um, looked at the slab, and I felt that, that part of it, might be due to an erosion issue. The, the, uh, the trees on each side are higher elevation than, the, than the, where the slab meets the, uh, the ground. And it looked like there was some water that was running down and maybe, maybe taking out the sides of the slab, uh, taking out the, the sides of the ground around the slab so that, so that the two are not, not level. And, um, uh, I think that that's, that's something that, that uh, needs to be maybe further reviewed or... I, no, not at this time, no. And uh, those, those are really my only comments. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Or? I also went out and um, visited the site. Uh, I would commend the homeowner on their landscaping of their front yard. It is beautiful, and I feel part of the beauty are those trees that are there. They add a great deal to the whole plan. Um, and I, I didn't see that much of a lift, to be honest. And um, I think it can be dealt with some other ways rather than losing a mature tree. Uh, I think they're truly a benefit to the whole neighborhood, but they also benefit the homeowner site tremendously. So any other? Yeah, Mr. Casebeer. Thank you, Chairman Longstreet. I got that right. Okay. Um, Mr. Downey, um, I, I'm not quite sure why this, you're recommending the removal of the tree on the right, um, on the corner. It appears to be healthy and growing. Um, I hate to lose any trees. Um, could you comment on that, please? Chair Longstreet, Commissioner Case Bear, the uh, tree located at the corner is uh, currently against the curb. Mm, As it grows in size, it will do one of two things, either push the curb or grow over the top of the curb, uh, which creates kind of a weak point for the tree. Um, because of those two issues, uh, it... it was determined that uh, it might be appropriate to remove it now before those uh, things occur. Okay. Any other discussion or issues? Mr. Burns. Yeah, um, as I, I, I looked at this, this I, I guess, a month ago and then looked at it again, um, I, I, I see the point that the applicant has that they, that the root is, is lifting the, the slab, but I, I really think that this this is a great tree. Uh, I, I, my 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 recommendation is they do the root the root root cutting, uh, and if there's an issue a year from now that it has gotten worse, then we revisit it and then possibly. Uh, let it be cut down to one in the center that they're requesting, but right now I'm, I, I would be voting to uh, deny it. Okay, any other discussion? Is there a motion on this tree? Uh, I will move to uh, concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee and staff to remove the tree on the right at the corner 
and uh, uh, retain the other two trees on the property. Okay. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. Now, I, I think what we're saying is giving the homeowner the right to remove that tree, but not require the, requiring them to remove that tree, correct? Chair Long Street, Commissioner Burns, that, that's correct. They have an option to exercise. Uh, they're not required to exercise that option. Good clarification. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Um, any decision of this body is appealable to the par uh, City Council within 10 days. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right. That brings us to item four, which is the residency. Re Chair Longstreet? Yes. I, I have a, a request or a motion that's most germane to the street tree issue. Okay. Um, I, I was just wondering if it would be possible to get a report from staff next meeting and agendize a, a discussion of storm damage to trees, um, park trees, as well as street trees. There's obviously been some discussion in the community, not necessarily the best informed discussion, um, and would be, I think it would be great for all of us to get a, a little a sense of um, where, what our staff is up to in, in mitigating and dealing with damage. Chair Long Street, Commissioner Hall, we'll be happy to put that forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're to item four, residency requirement for Street Tree Advisory Committee for action. Mr. Downey, is this you again? It's me again. Chair Long Street and Commissioners, the uh, Street Tree Advisory Committee had a discussion about um, the residency requirement for their committee. Um, there's some concern that uh, in the past the um, members of this committee have had to resign because they've moved outside the city limits. Um, and there's been some interest by other parties, other professionals in the area that aren't in the city limits to become involved in this process. Um, the Street Advisory Committee uh, decided to uh, submit a letter, which is in your packet, um, outlining their concerns. Um, the uh, one of the members of the street advisory committee, uh, Bob Cunningham, is here. If you have questions for him, um, and uh, the uh, to to go over a little brief history, the uh, over time there's been a number of changes to the committee. Um, however, it's been the residency has been a primary part of this committee since its inception, um, and. Um, the staff does not uh, support their request to uh, change the residency outside the city. Uh, beyond that, I'd be happy to answer questions or uh, Mr. Cunningham's available as well. Okay. Let's hear. Mr. Cunningham, did you want to speak to this item? Come on up. Oh. Not that quickly, though. <laughs> uh, hi, Bob Cunningham, member of the Street Tree Advisory Committee. Um, um, I I don't know why staff isn't supporting us, but uh, here there. we'll talk about that on next Thursday. Um, we, we just can't really find a good reason not to allow non-resident people to uh, to be on this committee. There, there doesn't seem to be any uh, any real connection between residency and competency for what we do. We currently have. Uh, a committee that's constituted of three landscape designers, a horticulturist, and a certified arborist. Uh, and, and that's a good makeup, uh, we all think, right now. But when, uh, as things transition, people uh, evolve off the committee, um, we feel that the, the city, the, the Parks and Recreation Commission, should have uh, as broad a field of experts to draw from as possible. Uh, we're not saying that we should go outside the county, but we feel that <clears throat> excuse me, there are some, some really well-qualified people who are anxious to serve um, who aren't allowed to simply because of this residency requirement. And again, uh, I, I think it's more a matter of, uh, you know, why shouldn't we allow this when there's really no compelling reason not to? That's really all. I mean, I, okay. I Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Khan. Um, do we have any other committees that have uh, residents outside of the city? 
Uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Connor, yes, it depends on the committee, and some committees actually have designated um, seats for particular um, interests. Other committees have, you know, just at large people on their um, on their committee. But the residency depends on the committee and the purpose of it. Um, the example that was uh, mentioned. Um, in a previous discussion to this meeting was the Golf Advisory Committee, which allows residents and the golf course is an enterprise fund and it serves the broader community. Um, and so in the structure of that advisory committee, it was felt it was appropriate to have residents and non-residents um, on the committee. <coughs> yes. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, the the staff report says that there's been ample interest in the committee in recent years. And uh, my question would be, how many qualified applicants did the Street Tree Advisory Committee get uh, last term for uh, last time there were appointments to be made? How many appointments were there and how many applicants were there? Can anyone tell me that? Uh, Chair Long Street, Commissioner Whitcomb, the uh, last term was this last December. Um, the committee serves two-year terms, so every year there is a uh, number of them that are up for uh, replacement. Um, at this last December, we had uh, reinstatement applications from the two incumbents uh, and no other applications. Thank you. <coughs> I would say, though, that um, we did reject two people, well reject, we did, weren't able to appoint two people that we then expanded the committee and appointed in about the previous two years, was it? So we had, when we were at three, we had, I think we had three or four applicants for Street Tree Advisory Committee and then we were able to go back to those people when we expanded the committee, so we did have interest at that point. <sighs> Other questions, concerns? Just in general discussion, um, well, let's start with, I think we're through with questions, so general discussion. So I, I have a concern. The, I mean, I think the committee does amazing work, and you know, anybody who's seen how I vote on these things, um, I'm always very, very reticent to question the recommendations of the committee. But um, a, a committee like this one, expertise isn't the only factor. Expertise is a huge factor, but it's not the only one. The other thing is that it's a committee that, though it doesn't have the final say, has a tremendous amount of authority, um, uh, informal authority, if you will, over, over being able to tell people what to do with their own property. That that being said, I think that there, I, I think that there there could be a problem down the line if we eliminate the residency requirement for the whole committee. Um, such that you one we could find ourselves in a situation in which non residents of the city are ha, have a, 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 a large influence over the city 's decision uh, decisions over people 's private property and and that I think is a governance problem i think that's a that 's a problem, um, especially given the fact that we all know that it 's not I, I hate to say this out loud and on camera, but we, we know that there that it is possible that people do sort of um, act first and ask questions later and when it comes to how, how they deal with um, setback trees. So there's a sort of give and take cooperation between the city's regulatory powers and regulatory ability and um, homeowner cooperation um, or property owner cooperation. Um, anything that sort of gets in the way of that cooperation, like feeling like it's outsiders that are telling us what to do with our property, I think could be a problem. So I, I'm... I, I, I would rather see a solution in which, um, as in the, is in the case of some of our other advisory groups, there's like one position that's open for a non-resident or can be a resident or a non-resident or two of them or whatever. But I would not want to sort of open up the gates to, so the, to put our commission or a future commission in a position where on a, in a given cycle, in a given year, in a given term, um, you know, the only people who appear to be qualified are all non-residents of the city, and we end up with a with a street tree advisory committee with no residents of the city. So, uh, so I would feel a lot more comfortable voting in favor of a of a change to the rules that um, only may, uh, uh, allowed this exemption for uh, one or two of the spots. Mm -hmm. This was come. 
Uh, I concur. I think that's a, a wonderful idea, and I think it's a, a good um, good solution to to the issue at hand. I will uh, try to talk, but some I'm getting I'm getting hoarse, and I don't know what happened. Um, I agree with both of those comments. I think uh, letting either one or two would make make sense. That would be the intent. I don't I don't think it would be. Suddenly five people would come on, but I, one or two would, would work. And realistically, where I live, if I was three blocks over, I'd be in the county. So it's, you know, I don't think that would have changed my perspective. But, so I, I mean, I can live with people that don't live in the city. So. Any other comments? Mr. Casebeer. I concur with my fellow commissioners in for the reason that I feel it's most important to... Um, secure, knowledgeable, effective people who know what they're doing. And where they live um, is secondary for, in my way of thinking. Okay. Um, Ms. Connor, did you have anything you want to? Um, I agree. Okay. Well, you know me, I'm always on the side of, of residency. Sorry. <laughs> I, I believe that um, we have several separate cities within this jurisdiction and the residents of that city are the ones who make the decisions within the city. If I move tomorrow, I am off this commission. So that's, um, that's my feeling on it and has been about a lot of things that we do within Parks and Recreation. So um, saying that, you know, I, I, I think the other part of it is when it, it's wide open, um, a lot of times people get involved by who they know. So, you know, we could get into a situation where we had mostly people that were outside the city, and I couldn't support that at all. I could go with a compromise of one. Um, and I'll say another thing is because right now we may have, let's say, one um, tree street tree advisory committee person who uh, would be off the committee because they moved, we don't change the rules because of one person's needs. Um, so I don't want to see us doing this with all of our committees because somebody wants to stay involved, but they don't live in the city any longer. So, uh, you know, I also am a little leery to open that gateway. Um, to me, it's a difference with an enterprise um, fund where, you know, actually the users are the ones supporting it. But in this case, the users are the residents of Santa Barbara. So um, I, I'm i more inclined to stay with the status quo, and uh, but I could support a, a single member. With that, um, is there any more? Oh, Mr. Casebeer. <coughs> Director um, Rapp, is there any urgency in this matter? Um, is the functioning of the Street Tree Committee in peril if we don't pass this today? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Casebeer, no, there is nothing time sensitive to this. Um, it could be a matter that the commission could revisit at, a, at another time, um, but it was initiated by the Street Tree Advisory Committee, which is why it's on your agenda at this time. I have one other question. Uh, there was an interesting point in there, and, and I recall this from past times. It used to be that the, the um, commission liaison was a voting member, and then that stopped. Why did we stop that? Because I think... From what we've seen recently in some of our tree issues, I would like the perspective of a voting member up here because some, sometimes we don't, um, we've run into some tough issues from the Street Tree Advisory Committee recently. <laughs> and I would have liked the, per, the perspective of a voting member at that. So um, how did that change and is that something we should be looking at? Uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, boy, that's one of those sad facts of the loss of institutional memory because I don't recall and none of my staff are shaking their heads. Um, I would defer if, if um, Bob um, has any selective memory related to that. No. So I don't know. Um, there certainly would not be any reason why the commission could not choose to um, uh, make 
the uh, commission liaison, a voting member of the Street Tree Advisory Committee. I, I don't believe that there's anything that precludes that. Okay. Well, it's just it was something that came up, and um, Ms. Connor and I, you know, I, th I think both remember when, it, I mean, that was a big deal. When you were the liaison, you went to every one of those um, meetings and that they w were voting. I mean, I remember when Ms. Baum that, did, and that was big, yeah. So um, could we maybe, if we're going to put this off as a decision, could we look at that also and how that would fit in and if it wouldn't sort of maybe as a commission we need to discuss whether that's something we want to take on. That's another aspect of it. Uh, uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner's staff would be more than happy to bring this back at a later time for the Commission to discuss the issue further. In the meantime, we can also look and see um, if there's anything that we need to know and make the Commission aware of as and, um, regards that change. We're going to, a little further on, we're going to get to um, liaison. Uh, and maybe when we do that and if we select, maybe we can have a little committee um, that meets with staff just to have a dis an hour-long discussion about where we are and where we want to go. Okay, so um, I guess we have to take action. We should have a motion to postpone this item and have staff revisit with these questions. Is there such a motion? Well, you know, originally I was all ready to yeah. approve it <laughs> with uh, one one person being uh, not being a city resident. I, I think we, I'd rather do that than push this down the road. So I, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, uh, make a that we make a motion that the Streets Tree Advisory Committee can have that that the Park and Rec Commission may appoint doesn't have to, but may appoint one member of the Street Tree Advisory Committee who is not a city resident. Hmm? Let's have a point of information or a question? I think we need a second on that. I second. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Now, second and go ahead. So would we need to designate which, for moving forward, which seat, so to speak, or which position is currently the one that is, that can be a non-resident so that when we do, I, I'm just wondering how it works with the appointment process if we leave it open that like, you know, up to one can be. Do we have one spot that is designated as um, open to non-residents? Am I chair long being up to Commissioner Hall, Lerma Hall? The um, it it would be advisable to uh, appoint up to one member, not a specific member. And a question for you: Does your motion? Um, um, regulate how far outside the city limits we would allow somebody? Yes, that's what I wanted to bring up. I, I, I think that the commission should stipulate uh, limits, uh, Santa Barbara County, or uh, that the motion should, should include that. I, well, I would, let's not get, I, I, I see your point, but I, I think that if we had three people looking to do the job and one of them, I don't know, just lived in Camarillo and everyone else maybe lived in Goleta or here, yeah, we would we would go on the assumption that we'd rather have somebody closer than further. But to, to say that it's 12 and a half miles or eight miles might be a little more detail. And I think possibly as we're making this motion that... Um, the city attorney will probably come in here and write something up for us to actually approve. Uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Burns, actually as a point of fact, not that long ago, the commission had before them an applicant for the Street Tree Advisory Committee that, I believe that was the committee, that was from San Francisco. And um, and had expressed a desire in being part of that committee. So I just put that out there that it can happen. It has happened. So you know, I just want to share that information. And then certainly, whatever uh, recommendation that the commission brings, will will staff will follow up with whatever appropriate documents need to be modified. Okay, thank you, Ms. Wiscombe. 
Yeah, that that would have been my point. I'm I'm not sure I'd be comfortable with someone who lives in Ventura County uh, uh, voting on our um, street tree advisory committee. Mr. Casebear. I'll come back to my point that I was discussing before about um, the urgency in this matter. And I'm, this is my first um, commission meeting and I feel like I'm not quite up to speed. And um, it seems like we're doing committee work here at the commission um, and maybe better spent if we had some time to put our minds together to really craft a well um, thought out um, recommendation. Thank you. But we do have a motion on the floor that has been seconded and is under discussion. So, um, yes, Mr. I'm, I'm prepared to vote yes on the motion, uh, whether or not it, it ends up being amended to include a, uh, like a geographical boundary. I don't have strong feelings about it either way. Um, I think that given that we're restricting the openness to one position, um, and I think distance from Santa Barbara will probably would probably be a factor if in future um, deliberations about specific candidates. I, I don't think it needs to be in there, but I don't think it's a it, it's not a deal killer for me if if, if we attach it. But I'm, I'm definitely ready to vote on the uh, on the motion as okay. as framed. The motion before us is to um, allow one member of the Street Tree Advisory Committee to be a non-resident of Santa Barbara City. Correct. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Aye. And so that passes. So um, I still would like to see us get together and have a committee about um, our, uh, have a little discussion about our uh, liaison position and how that fits in. Okay. All right. Thank you. That item is complete. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have some advisory committee appointments. I assume you gentlemen are here for... No? <laughs> okay. Ms. Rapp. We have... I was writing my to-do list to make sure that I brought that <laughs> item back to the commission. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, on the advisory committee interview and appointments, you have uh, uh, three vacancies before you. One vacancy with the Golf Advisory Committee. You have two applicants, um, one who is currently an incumbent um, and, uh, and then another new applicant, both vying for the community at large position. On the IPM Advisory Committee, you have two vacancies uh, with one applicant, um, and, uh, and that gentleman has actually served on the IPM Advisory Committee um, previously. Okay. So for golf, we have um, Vic Giglio, and he's an incumbent, so I guess he's not here for an interview. And the other is John Stoney. Mr. Stoney, would you like to come up and talk to us? Welcome. If you just introduce yourself and then just tell us briefly about your involvement at the golf course and what you're interested in. John Stoney uh, moved to Santa Barbara when I went to college starting in 1958. So I've been here, what, 52 years. Taught at San Marcos High School for 37 years. Uh, was golf coach at San Marcos because of a bunch of great kids, had a pretty good record. Uh, I'm presently retired. I'm a marshal at uh, the Muni Golf Course. I feel I have something to offer to the committee and would like to see the course get better. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of Mr. Stoney? Thank you. Um, have you ever been to any of the meetings? No. Okay. Have you got any particular goals in mind of what you're planning to do other than just you give your expertise? Uh, I think it's tragic that we've lost so many golfers at Muni. 
I understand we're down over 43% from last year to this year, and it can't be all construction. I mean, there's specials being offered by Glen Annie. They're taking a lot of our golfers. Uh, we got to do something to get our golfers back. That would be one thing I'd really like to aim at. Good. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Um, any other questions at this time? None? Okay. Thank you. And the decision is made when? and Right now. Oh. Right yeah. now. If you... If... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have before us um, an incumbent and then someone and a new person. So um, it's kind of a tough choice in those cases because we have two very qualified people. And Chair Longstreet and commissioners, um, in the interest of uh, fairness and also um, <clears throat> this, um, how this is being presented to you is a little uh, different than in the past. Usually if we have incumbents that wish to continue to serve, we don't do a recruitment um, and the incumbents um, aren't required to be here to um, be interviewed. Um, and uh, due to a delay in Mr. Giglio's um, uh, response back to the department, we, we did open up the recruitment um, and we did invite Mr. Giglio to be here tonight. So I, I do think, because that's very unusual, usually when we have incumbents, they're, they're yeah, okay. treated a little differently. Um, but I, I do feel that that's important information for the commission to have because it's very unusual for us. Okay. Well, and I know we want um, everyone's help at the golf course. We want to involve as many people as we can to make it a better place. So uh, we need all the ideas right now, and I know that committee is working really hard to bring golfers back and to make sure that um, our golf course is the best place to play in Santa Barbara. So um, I, uh, I think it would be, you know, I, I am a little concerned that we're not seeing the incumbent here and that there was a delay in some of this. It might be a time for a change, maybe, and maybe Mr. Giglio would still enjoy some involvement in other ways. Um, those meetings are open to the public. So um, I don't know. Other thoughts? Yes, Ms. Wiscombe? Make a motion? You surely can. Uh, I move that the uh, commission appoint uh, John Stoney to the community at large uh, member for the Golf Advisory Committee. I'll second. Okay. In discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Welcome aboard. Um, I just have one comment. You have to have all your old students come and play at the golf course. <laughs> just teasing. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Great. Thank you, and thank you for volunteering. Please and, to show up. Um, and our next appointment is an incumbent, and it is Oscar Carmona, who has served uh, long on the, uh, I think, since the inception of the IPM committee and is a valuable member. So um, I would move that we reappoint Mr. Carmona. Second. <laughs> okay. All in uh, need discussion? All in favor? Oh, wait, wait, Chris wait, wait, has a question. Oh, yes. My ignorance, could you please explain to me what this integrated pest management advisory committee does? Um, or something the integrated know. pest management, and uh, Mr. Santos, if I don't get it all right, uh, they review the pesticide use within the parks within the city. And they also review um, requests for uh, use of, of t t level... The, that's, that's correct. Exemption yeah. requests that do come forward when we do have me, a major outbreak of some sort of a pest that the material may be, not be on our city list, but we need to do something different. Mm -hmm. And so they provide their expertise to help us out. Also, another item that they do go through and vote on is our annual report that you'll be seeing sometime in March. And that Will, would include our usage for the entire city, for all our departments? It's an area we're very proud of. It's, that is our IPM program. 
a lot of hard work by staff and um, volunteers to get that up and going. So, and it's award winning as well. Yes. Right. And and this is somewhat off the subject, but on the subject is one of the things they were also doing, and I'm not sure how well they're doing it, is to br bring volunteers in to help uh, the department with uh, something as simple as weeding. So there's there's more there's more to just getting it started. There's a continuing process trying to uh, help the city c uh, cut costs. Okay. Now, we have a motion on the floor to appoint Mr. Carmona. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, okay, now we are to our um, liaison committee reports. And the first comment I must make is how much shorter this list is now. I noticed that there seems to fit on one page. Okay. Um, I think probably the best way to do this is to just go down. We have someone in each position. Um, and if one of our new committee members would like to volunteer for something, to just speak up and we'll kind of juggle it around. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yes, uh, Chair Longstreet. I'd like to volunteer uh, for the um, golf course advisory. Well, let's committee. go down one at a time. We're oh, going to okay. start with arts and crafts, okay. and Mr. Burns is on there. How do you feel about it, Mr. Burns? Are you? It is one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life. <laughs> Um, actually, well, maybe I won't go that far. Uh, it, it, there, it's, in, it's got some challenges that I've been helping with, and I've been probably causing some of the challenges. Um, so I, am, I, I feel that I should continue on it uh, at least for another year. And, and I would have to agree with the, um, the changes that are coming, that it would be best to keep a steady presence there. Um, I would like to ask about Mr. Hockman and Creeks. I know that was a big one for him. Has he expressed an interest in staying with that? Um. Um, uh, Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, I don't know which means that he, I assume since he knew he wasn't going to be here and he'd gotten his agenda packet and if he had a particular strong feeling about not continuing in that role, I would have imagined have let us that know. He, would okay. have, he would have notified you. Okay. So um, I think we'll maybe leave Mr. Hockman there. Uh, Douglas Family Preserve Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, Chair Longstreet and yes. Commissioners, just um, to remind you, and I'm, I'm, we should, should have probably noted it, this committee, the commission actually um, suspended activity in this committee for a year. So um, it might oh, I'll be, keep it then. <laughs> yeah, you might <laughs> might be something that you want to leave and then revisit. You know, and if no, there were an issue that came up, we would call the committee together. But at this point, that's where the yeah. status of the committee lies. Okay. And then we come to Franklin Center. Is there anyone that we have a vacancy there? Um, the advisory committees um, <laughs> are undergoing some changes at this point. Um, so. Did you want to? Yeah, um, I, I would like to, I mean, to jump the gun a little bit, um, I think there, there, there may be a new commissioner who might be better qualified to serve as the liaison to the Street Tree Advisory Committee, for example. So I would be happy to take the okay. Franklin Center. Okay, we've got you at Franklin. Um, front Country Trails. I think we probably ought to stick with that one. Um, that meets quarterly. Um, it's, a, it's our... Um, joint use with the county and the Forest Service, and uh, we probably, I've been on it since its inception, so I'd like to continue with that one. Um, the golf course. I had heard some interest down at that end, um, and I would be very happy to give the golf course. Thank you. Over. Okay. Um, IPM. Anybody? If there's anyone who has interest, I'm happy to trade, give it up. It doesn't meet they, very often these this days. This is a learning experience. I'm yeah. willing to learn. Okay. Well, then we'll put you down for IPM. Okay. 
Uh, Lower Mission Creek Design Committee. Uh, let's leave Mr. Hockman there. That hardly ever meets. Um, it will have a flurry of activity if they get some money, uh, but it's not a real. Lower West Side. Um, are they meeting jointly? Are they still meeting? Still meeting separately, okay. Uh, um, the fact that I'll be gone off the West Side Whenever uh, in six months, I did. And do you know when they're going to oh, when they're going to combine the two? No, not at this point. No. Okay. Okay. So Lower West Side, did you want to continue on that? Okay. Um, the Park Foundation, um, I would like to continue on that and with Mr. Burns. Um, Street Tree. I'd be happy to uh, to serve on that. Committee. I think we'd really benefit um, by your expertise in that area. I think. Okay, West Side is. Um, I can stay on the West Side, uh -huh. and then when they combine, maybe the time that I'm leaving, so Duraka could, if he's so inclined, could be on the two. Okay, if that works. Well, we will cross that bridge when we come to it and see how what we end up with at the end of this whole planning process. Okay. Here, Long uh, Street, if yes. I could add a perspective. Um, uh, Mr. Laramore Hall is the representative on uh, two of the neighborhood centers, and Ms. Connor is on one. And um, I think it probably would be wise to maybe have um, three Commissioners, only because I think as this effort moves forward, for the Commission to have a very good understanding of the neighborhood issues that are discussed as part of these meetings will help the Commission in forming recommendations that come forward out of that group that will go to City Council. So it would point. be my recommendation if, in fact, uh, the Commissioners can uh, make that happen. Okay. Um, what, okay. Wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Mr. Mr. Laramore Hall. I, I was just going to say I, I agree. I think that's a, a very good point. Um, I think that um, the other thing I and I was wanting to raise is that um, Commissioner Casebeer, um, the the uh, neighborhood centers are a very, very good way to sort of see um, one of the other sides of, of the department and, and, and the commission's work and so forth. So I think taking on one of the um, liaison roles for one of the neighborhood centers um, if you're interested in sort of learning fast and furiously, that's a, that's a good one to take on. And um, so in, in terms of which ones um, I have moved recently from the west side to the east side, so staying on the Franklin Center probably makes the most sense. Okay, so you'd want to give up the lower west side? Sure. So for clarification, when they do join together, would there be three commissioners on that one? Let, I, I, yeah. I don't think we've decided Long Street that. and okay. Commissioner. Sorry. I just, uh, at this point, there is not a recommendation on the final format. Okay. So, and we're operating on the assumption that there would likely be one neighborhood center advisory committee in some format. But since that, they are still operating as three. And um, so, I, I just don't want us to make decisions based on assumptions that uh, we don't know what the outcome yeah. is yet. Okay, that's the clarification I needed. Thank you. Would you like the Lower West Side, Mr. Casebeer? Yes, the West Side does interest me, and youth and recreation does too. So, and seeing that uh, Commissioner Connor may be uh, will be um, stepping aside, um, then it would give me a chance. Well, to we were thinking of you for the Lower West Side. Oh, wait. still on the West Side. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. But we we okay. have three. Um, the Lower West Side is the other side of the freeway and below Carrillo to um, around Gutierrez. Okay. So it's the area um, right below McKinley School. And that is where I started. Oh. I did eight years on the Lower West Side Advisory Committee prior to joining this commission. Thank you for the <laughs> opportunity. It's a very enjoyable. And the last one is Youth Council. Do you, how do you feel about that? I, I honestly, you know, as well, I was um, being a little facetious about the arts and crafts show. Uh, the youth council is a very well-grounded, 
group of teenagers that I enjoy being with. But at the same time, if someone else would like to do it, it's, I, I, don't, I, I don't own it, and I, I don't know if I give a lot of input because they seem to be run very well. If someone else would be interested in doing it, I, I, I'd give it up. But I'm, I'm very, I enjoy the, enjoy the kids. Huh? Well, um, you know, I think I might enjoy doing that until I leave, if that would be okay. Um, okay. So, I'll take that. Thank you. And I, and I will, uh, I will t take you to the next meeting, which will be uh, next uh, Tuesday, I think. Uh, it's it, there's a, it's got change for some, okay. uh, but I'll talk to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so is everybody happy? Ecstatic. Okay. Staff happy? Yeah. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, just to follow up, I just wanted to um, indicate that staff will be um, following up with the commissioners who are serving in new roles to uh, arrange a time for them to have some orientation. Um, hopefully before the next advisory committee meeting so we can give you some background and um, and all of that. So we'll follow up with you, um, a member of my staff, and um, and give you that background so you can okay. be more effective right off the gun. And, and it really is a great way to get to know the different facets of the department. Um, I would say that as a liaison, you're not expected to um, to do. I mean, you're not you're not a participant so much in the meeting. You you sometimes bring information that's come from the commission, or uh, more likely bring information back to us. But it does make people feel like we're paying attention when we attend on a regular basis. So, thank you. Um, okay, so we've completed that. And that brings us to um, our Parks and Recre Recreation Commission youth member um, ordinance. Ms. Hanna. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening um, to Commissioner Casebeer, and welcome to both of you and uh, Commissioner Westcom. This, this is really great, having seven on our committee. So Back um, to the old days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to be talking about the new appointment of the a youth member on the commission. Um, way back in November, the voters approved Measure C, which amended the city charter to allow a new combined park and recreation commission with seven members. And it also um, authorized the council to appoint a youth member, 16 years or older, who resides within the city, to serve on the commission. But it left open the manner of appointing and the term of service of that youth member, which was to be later established by ordinance should the charter amendment pass. So it did pass, and we um, came together to uh, establish a subcommittee of two commissioners, um, Longstreet and Burns, and also two youth council members, Shara, uh, Katie Shara and intern Diego Torres Santos. Uh, to who got together for a subcommittee meeting and they reviewed the current guidelines of the City of Santa Barbara Advisory Group Committee and also a draft ordinance that the city attorney had prepared. And pretty much from the get-go, the subcommittee felt that they wanted to go with the same manner of appointment and service for the youth member to follow that of the Park and Recreation Commissioners. Um, but there were concerns that were raised, and I want to discuss those briefly um, and let you know how we've addressed those concerns. So one of the main things that, um, one of the first things that came out was what would happen? It's a four-year term, and students that may be appointed at 16 may graduate and go away to school and may only be able to serve two years. Um, would they be re reluctant to apply because they you know, they might not be around for two years. But we discussed several ideas, and because um, we do have good outreach with our youth council members, which is a natural segue to this commission, and also with other leadership groups um, in the community with teenagers, we felt that we could approach them and share with interested applicants, you know, the possibility that they may want to end their term early but that the guidelines allow for that and that there is a policy in place of how those positions and vacancies, whether someone resigns or um, becomes ineligible, what happens when that 
when um, someone we need to change a commissioner. So it would just follow the same city advisory uh, guidelines, but it was also um, Parks and Recreation Director Nancy Rapp um, was also at the meeting and expressed that she typically meets with uh, commissioner applicants to talk to them about their personal interests and the really the wide breadth of commitment to being on the commission, the number of meetings and that type of thing. So also at that time, Nancy could talk to them about um, their decision and you know their comfort with maybe serving two years or maybe they would be here for four years. So we felt those, um, those discussions were good opportunities and that we wouldn't, because we decided on a four-year term, we wouldn't lose applicants of youth. I think there's a lot of youth out there that are interested in serving on leadership roles. Another um, concern that came up was if several youth members came before council, how would council determine who they're going to select? What types of criteria would they use? Um, and as we all know, uh, commissioners are appointed by city council. It's their responsibility. And though sometimes it is very difficult decisions because, you know, the number of citizens in the city are, have very vast experiences, um, it is their responsibility to select the best candidate. And we also, it was brought up at the subcommittee that perhaps an additional question that is on the slate that city council has when they interview applicants could be put on there to address uh, youth issues in some way. So we did ask the two subcommittee members from Youth Council to develop a question and when and if we move forward to City Council we'll add some questions that kind of serve to help ferret out um, who is the best candidate of the youth member. Um, another uh, concern was that it was in the original draft of the ordinance it was con called a youth member and uh, there was concern that maybe unintendedly it implied that it was a category or a designation. Does that mean that that person is the youth member and whereas none of the other commission spots are designated? Um, and the subcommittee didn't really feel that they wanted a youth member category, only that they wanted a member that could ha be under 18 years of age. So we returned to the city attorney and he changed the the draft ordinance, so instead of it saying youth member, it says applicant under age 18. And so this does not designate a youth position per se. There was also another big concern about, well, what happens when they turn 18? Are they disqualified? Um, do they have to be a qualified elector? What does that mean? Um, and again, we went back to the city attorney. He did explain to me that a qualified elector is someone that is over age 18, has residency, is a citizen, um, but doesn't necessarily have to be registered to vote. They don't have to have designated a political party, for instance. Um, so you can be a qualified elector even if you're not a voting member of our public, as long as you have residency and you're a citizen and you're above 18 and you aren't kicked out for the other reasons that some qualified electors are kicked out, like felonies or some of the other things. So um, we discussed that with him. He, he agreed that uh, we needed to make that more clear that once you reached 18, you weren't disqualified and that you would continue to serve the balance of your term um, and that the disqualifications would not disqualifications would not deviate from the current guidelines of the advisory committee. So to address those two things, if you look at the ordinance that is the draft ordinance that is attached, um, under section 2B, you can see that it changed from being saying youth member to persons under the age of 18. And then he also added two um, Section 2A, 2B number 4 um, that talks about not disqualifying a person once they reach the age of 18 and they are able to conserve the balance of their term, whether they started at 17 and they end at 21 or 16 and they end at 20, they always can uh, finish the balance of their term. And then also uh, B6, uh, that when a youth member reaches the age of 18, this is kind of a little tricky. 
um, should a new vacancy come up, we don't, we do have the opportunity to appoint a new youth member. So there isn't a designation for a youth member, and if, if they age up and they become an adult, then that's a new opportunity that the council may, but is not, never required to appoint a youth. So um, we hoped that he achieved flexibility, but also clarity so that folks reading the ordinance would understand, okay, what that, does that mean? And it'll be easier to, to interpret in the future. Um, so we took the, the new draft ordinance, the revisions, I took them to Youth Council on uh, January 19th. They had many of the same, uh, I discussed what we had discussed at subcommittee, but they had many of the same types of concerns. But a couple of things that came out there was, um, you know, what are the reasons that someone could be disqualified? And of course, that still follows the advisory committee guidelines. Um, they were curious about city residency and why should the residency be only in the city? And were they, did they live in the city? And we gave them information on how to find out if you did, or in fact, live in the city limits. But um, it, the residency goes back to the charter and the charter language. And the charter did not ask for a non-resident vo voting member. It asked for a resident, similar to all the other positions on commission. Um, and I further explained that they are advisory to city council and to this city's government and this budget and the resources and the use of resources that are earned and spent by the city. So um, though that was a little disappointing for some because there are quite a few youth members, uh, youth council members that do live outside the city limits, it was understood that they are an advisory to city council and that's the important role of the, our commission. So with that, um, they did uh, approve the recommendation to move it forward to the Park and Recreation Commission. Uh, should the Park and Recreation Commission uh, approve the ordinance as it stands tonight, it will go to Ordinance Committee in February. And in approximately March sometime, go to Council for the final hearing of the ordinance and adoption. And should all of that go as planned, then when Commissioner Connor steps down, we have an opportunity to hire a youth member, not required to, but an opportunity by council to appoint a youth member to our commission. So with that, I Thank you. leave it to you and any questions that you may have. Okay, well I just, uh, having served on that subcommittee, I just, one of our goals is this, um, this is a full-fledged commission appointment, and we did not want to designate it as anything less. And um, changing the qualifications or the length of service or any of those things seemed to um, water it down, I guess is what I'd say. And, um, and our expectations would be that this person would serve as any other commissioner serves. So um, that was the reason to going to keep it lined up with what we have now. So, Mr. Larimore Hall. This is really excellent. Um, I really want to commend the, the subcommittee on very good work. Um, I hope that, uh, I hope that the, the final ordinance looks as close to this as possible, if not exactly like it. I think it's elegant. Um, I think that if you go back to the discussion that we had of this idea as a, as a, as a commission, um, you know, there were kind of, there were two. There were two concerns hinging on kind of the same thing, and one was um, from a kind of youth empowerment perspective: Are we not? Would we not be creating a kind of ghettoized position that would be sort of seen or stigmatized as like, oh, that's the the youth member? Um, there was that concern was raised, and sort of on the other side, it was, um, you know, can't. Uh, would we lower expectations for this, and would that sort of like bring the level of discourse on the council down or on the on the commission down, et cetera? I think that that approaching this from saying that at any given point, if there is not a youth member on the commission, the council has the option um, to fill a vacancy with a, a a person under the age of eighteen, and leaving it. At, I mean, like framing it that way is a perfect way, I think, to get at both of those concerns. Um, I, I, I'm very excited. I think it's great. Um, good job all around. Um, we'll be very, very happy to vote for this. Um, 
those are my thoughts on the on the draft ordinance. I did have a question though um, about, uh, and I might have misheard or misunderstood, um, but the uh, adding a question to the questionnaire or to the application about youth issues that would be adding. Obviously, that would be adding a question to the generic questionnaire that any applicant has to fill out. So regardless of the age of the applicant, they would be answering that question. Is that correct? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Larimo Hall, there's two parts, and I may have misspoke. The application currently asks if you are a qualified elector, a citizen, and have um, citizenship in the United States, of U.S. citizenship. And we would have to modify that because they wouldn't be a qualified elector. So we do, we will be working with the city um, clerk's office to slightly modify that so that there is some way of conveying that they are a minor uh, applying for a very specific position. But the second part, um, now I can't remember, I lost my line of thought. The application. It's the questions the council interview, asks. The inter uh, yes, city council has a set of interview questions that they are able to use, similar to what you have when you interview applicants. And there wasn't anything that kind of directed people down the path of talking about youth issues and how they relate to youth, youth issues or how they are involved with working in the community regarding youth issues. So um, we asked the youth council members to develop a question that we could add to that slate of questions for council members to use in their interview process. And if I might add, the, the interview questions would be for all applicants to the Park and Recreation Commission, because it's really more getting at the opportunity to talk about youth issues and their familiarity and perspective, et cetera. And provided ahead of time. Let's Ms. Wiskin. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I have to um, commend the um, subcommittee on, on the um, coming to the meat or the heart of, of what some of the issues are here. Um, I have a couple questions, I'm, I'm, and I think part of it is because I'm a new commissioner. I'm, Measure C to me was an intent to appoint, have the council appoint a commissioner that was more at the heartbeat of youth issues. Um, am, am I correct in that? that? That's kind of how I understood it when I voted for it. <laughs> I'd say so. Um, we've always, you know, we're the only um, commission that I know of to date that has had a youth intern for as long, and I think we've had one maybe seven or eight years now since we've had our youth council, maybe longer, ten or more. Ten or more. Um, so it was... Um, Wrapping that into going to seven as a commission, um, one of the thoughts was that we should have a dedicated, be able to appoint someone under that age. Okay, th thank you for that. Um, okay, well, uh, let me just kind of go through my questions here, I guess. Um, w with that intent in mind, and I, under I fully understand two a two-year term it puts that commissioner in a different light than maybe a four-year term. But it seems to me that if, if, in theory, someone's appointed when they're 16 and then they turn 18 and, you know, they, they become adults and go off to college maybe or maybe not or maybe go to school locally, it's, it, it, we're, we're maybe losing a little bit with the four-year term of the, of the kind of the heart of the intent um, as that person becomes an adult and my my and then as you go on if that person turns started at 16 and turns 20 and then wants to continue to serve on the commission and there's no other commission um, no other commission appointments coming up then we've lost the opportunity for that time to actually have a youth commissioner if the council so chooses. Um, so that, that's just one of my points. I, I'm just trying to get my, get a grasp and, on this. And I understand what you're saying. We didn't want, though, one of the things that was bothering me when we talked about two-year terms is that we were automatically assuming that it, all of these kids that we were going to get are going to be the kids that are going to go to school far away. 
who are we to say that? You know, we've got a great city college system. We've got kids that might go off into the work world. They're still going to be really close to that perspective, even as they get to 20. And I would hope that they would stay involved. Um, and it would be uh, up to council then to fill the next vacancy and make a decision on maybe booting out one of us old folks and putting somebody else in. Um, but, uh, you know, it was not, uh, my thought behind that two-year term was it was a big assumption. We were saying, you know, yeah, you're important, but you're only important for two years. And the rest of us are here for four. So I didn't, I, I, that bothered me. Okay. I, I, I think that's a great explanation. And that, that. Let me jump in because I've, I may help explain it a a little differently, but along the same line. Our, our concern was that if we found a, a junior in high school who wanted to do this, but knew that he was going to go away to college, he had already picked the place where she had picked the place she was going to go, that she wanted to apply. We wanted them to know that apply, and we have a process that you can resign after two years if you want to, uh, because we didn't want to limit it to people who said, well, I know I will be here for four years. We wanted it, we would rather have two years of somebody who's doing a great job than not even have that person want to attend. Does that help? Yes, th thank you very much, Commissioner Burns. That helps, that helps a lot, yes. I, um, I, I think the uh, criteria for the selection by the additional questions is, is a question is a great one. I'd like to see it as this is a very picky minor point, but question or questions, because there may be more than one question that, that would be um, suitable to, to ask that, that um, commissioner. Um, and then I guess my last comment, and, and I'm, I'm confused about this, and that's the terminology for this person, the, the um, applicants under age 18, because the draft ordinance basically calls this person a youth member. Um, first of all, why are we not calling it a commissioner? Because this person is a commissioner. But at the very title of it, it, it youth member, and then uh, there's another section in here, um, Yes, um, Section 2A, number 1, uh, the City Council may but is not required to appoint a youth member to the Parks and Recreation Commission. Are we keeping that term or are we changing that term in, this, in the draft ordinance? Chair Longstreet and uh, Commissioners and Commissioner Wiscom, this is a really... Actually, uh, from sitting in the committee discussion and the work that we did with the city attorney in developing the draft ordinance language, and I actually would like to have the commission give perspective back to see if there's a concurrence with the um, question that is being asked, because it makes me wonder if, in fact, what we really need in the description is exactly what this position is. The kind of we started out with um, that, you know, the discussion was that this is uh, an opportunity for a youth 16 years or older to serve. And not specifically that it's designated as a youth member, but we don't, that is nowhere in the ordinance for clarification. And I think um, when we're looking at this, and this is why I would ask the Commission, as you read through this, does it strike you that way? Because maybe what is missing is actually something where it is stated very clearly that, you know, this is a commissioner, um, that, you know, an a the applicant can be 16 years or older, um, but it is not a designated position specific to you know, I, I'm s struggling with the language, but, um, you know, that it's a youth, a youth member to represent the youth perspective specifically, I guess is what I'm trying to get but to. I think, again, though, once we say represent the youth perspective, what is that? 
this could, I mean, you know, the youth perspective that's all conservative, all liberal, a skateboarder, uh, you know, we can't say. They're, they're just a young person. So there's no distinct perspective here. I th I'm wondering if we can't take, for instance, when um, Chris and I applied for the commission, why can't we take that language, which is commissioner, and just add that, you know, one of the applicants, one of the positions that's open is for someone who is 16 years or older? And um, leave all the other language the same and I, not call gonna, this person anything different. I'm going to have to stop because right now we're getting into city attorney territory. Okay. And I don't want us to try to craft an ordinance without the city attorney's input on it. I think this was crafted by him to address some of these issues that are a concern. So I don't want us to do that at this time here because... Um, I think a lot of, of work went into this from a legal point of view to make it match up with the charter and all the other issues. And as what, back to your question, Ms. Rapp, I think where it says um, Section 809 of the city charter allows for the appointment of a person under the age of 18 to the Parks and Recreation Commission. And then it says a youth member. I think that person is just being referred to throughout as that, I don't, I, I don't see that that's a huge one. Um, the appointment and service of any person who's appointed as a youth member to serve. I, I don't know. Um, we can check with the city attorney, but. Uh, Chair Longstreet and commissioners, I think I was just looking for a reality check. That's all. <laughs> just, I think it's very important because this commission was engaged in the proposal that went to city council that resulted in the language in on the ballot and it got passed and, and all of the discussions that went forward along with that including the discussion at council for what it is and isn't I just am asking that as you read through this is it clear enough for somebody who's looking at this seven years from now that 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 was the intent that's that's really what I'm asking since you have some fresh perspective um, and and that's all I'm I'm suggesting. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't have a, my only uh, comments were related to the fact that that I was confused about the the applicants uh, that that the draft ordinance was changed from youth member to applicants under age 18, and uh, there are still references to youth member. That's where I was confused. I don't have a problem with youth member per se, if that's the terminology, and I'm not here to try to change the ordinance. Um, I, think, I think it's clear my question had just related to the fact that I thought that term had been deleted yeah. from the draft ordinance. And I think here, you know, number one, two, three, are refer to when we have a youth applicant, and then once, then I think four, five, and six, refer to once someone has been re appointed. And so uh, they're a member. I think we're, maybe we're all referred to as members at that point. You know, so I, I would have to defer to the city attorney at that. Oh, yeah, we're old members. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so I think there's actually, uh, I mean, I don't think that it's the language in the ordinance in terms of how they refer to this commissioner is hugely important. I think that the, the political culture on the on the commission is much more important. And I think that the the way that the, the fact that this ordinance sets out the same rights and responsibilities for a person who's under 18 as over 18 on the commission does the most important things to mainstream bringing a, a young member onto the commission. Um, that being said, I... and Again, I don't. I agree with with uh, with Chair Longstreet that that we, we shouldn't. We should lim We should limit. We should fight the temptation to try to write ling legal language. Um, I I do think that the the first sentence under uh, you know Part B um, 
the, just the sort of introductory sentence that says the, the city council chooses to consider applicants for appointment as a youth member of the Parks and Recreation Commission in the following manner. That that, that is what that definitely um, communicates what we're trying to avoid. That there is a youth position on it, and I think that one sentence can be easily reworded. Such just going to the using the language of saying that you know this will be the procedure. This shall be the following shall be the procedure and regulations surrounding a uh, applicant to the commission who is under eighteen. You know, so and I think the the rest of it is just referring to the applicant as being a young person, and that's fine. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, I think you don't have to worry about the language. I think if you are just if you want to direct staff to work with the city attorney to modify language and so, I think if you just that's all you need to do you don't have to um, craft the language and, and I think as long as we are carrying forward your intent um, you know if with your approval with that comment I think that that's and, sufficient. and remember this is going to get reworked at another level yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and with that I think I'd like to Entertain a motion. Call for no, actually, I, I, I may I may end up making a motion, but I was going to make yeah, some, let's go. For I was going to make some comments first. Uh, I I was probably one of the only uh, people in the city who actively voted against this, and actually um, didn't think it would work. Um, but, but I and I was also on the uh, the committee to to structure the draft ordinance. Um, and I'm, I'm very much in favor of it as it is now. Um, one of the comments that we talked about with the youth is that there is a time commitment and we wanted them to realize that you just, you, you've got to actually do some work and not just sit up here. Uh, another comment is that it's the city council may appoint a youth member, not that they must, but also at, in our discussions, we were explaining to the youth that it would be our assumption that the city council would not expect them to have the same level of life experience as someone who has been, you know, as old as I am, I guess. I don't know. Um, so, you know, so we're not, but we're expecting youth to have it. But just because we've got this in June, we're expecting to have youth apply. There may be some adults apply too. We're not, you know, we, we don't know. Uh, the one reason there was an issue with the uh, teen council and residency is that to be on a teen council, you're required to go to local high schools, not to be a member of the city, not to be in the city. And it, it, it kind of caught them unawares. Um, we're still planning to continue having a, 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 a youth council uh, liaison, uh, such as uh, Diego, who's not here right now uh, and normally is here, would be. So we're still going to have that. Um, I think it's a it's a good it's a good it's a good program. With that being said, unless somebody else wants to do it, I move that we approve this draft with the possible wording changes that may be needed as uh, the attorney is asked to review it one more time. And I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Passes unanimously, and thank you. Um, we don't very often get to do something this exciting. So, yeah, this is making history. So it is. It's it very is. exciting. The youth council is very excited about it. So the thanks for all change. your help on all of it. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for all your hard work to staff. It's I know it. it you come here with a report, but it's ours at the city attorney's office. So thank you very much. Um, now. We come to, um, do we want to take maybe just a five minute break and before we start into proposed fees, how's there? Yeah, let's take a five minute, but really just a five minute. To look for you, but maybe you. You said your arms would always hold me You said your lips were mine alone to kiss Okay, I will call the Parks and Recreation Commission meeting back to order 
And we are on item eight, proposed changes to the Parks and Recreation Department fees and charges schedule for action. Ms. Rapp. Chair Longstreet and Commission, what you have before you is the first time in my history with the department that we have ever brought this uh, measure before you. We are in essence asking you to review and approve fee uh, changes that if you approve will go to City Council for approval. These are typically the types of changes that we would make with our proposed budget for the following year. They would be reviewed as part of the department's budget, um, going through the public review process, and, um, and then approved in June. And historically, even though the fees are approved in June, we have not implemented most of those fee changes until September 1st because most of our summer programs, we do the registration for those in the spring. So I, it is very unusual that you are getting this request at this time. I need you to understand why we are asking you to do this and, and the report lays it out. But basically, when the FY10 budget was adopted, we took significant reductions in order to balance the budget, as you will recall. In August, because city revenues had declined further than our very conservative estimates, we were asked to um, propose a number of additional reductions that would go into effect August, August in August, which we did, so we cut our budget again. The department is now in the process and we have identified an additional $500,000 in mid-year reductions that are being considered by the City Council and will be discussed by the City Council um, uh, in order for the City's general fund to um, end the year without having to go into reserves, largely because um, sales tax and TOT revenues are down uh, throughout the state on the sales tax. Our, our loss matches what the state numbers are. Um, but things are, this is a pretty tough year. Um, so with that, we obviously have proposed a number of expenditure reductions. Um, and at the same time, we realized that we have not, um, and we had actually planned to do fee increases in FY11. We are proposing to you to do those fee increases now so that we can apply them to the registrations that take place um, during the spring for the programs that run basically in the summer. So we are ahead of the game. The reason is the budget situation is so hurtful that every opportunity that we have to generate additional revenue we need to take. Um, Sarah Hanna is going to uh, run you through the proposal and give you a bit of history, but I wanted to kind of you know, set the framework and also for the new um, commissioners to let you know this is just extremely unusual to go forward with fee increases prior to the full budget review process. Ms. Hanna. Good evening again. Um, so staff spent quite a bit of time doing mid-year projections and trying to figure out exactly where we were going to be with revenues and um, gosh, where we could go to find some new revenues or to stimulate participation to bring some of our revenues back up. Um, and through this process, one of the, the items that came out was, well, maybe we shouldn't wait in raising some of our summer fees that haven't been raised in two years. Um, so that, as Nancy said, we could capture those funds uh, now and um, have them in place. Because we don't like to, in the middle of summer, change our fees. It's not good for our marketing. It's not good for our website. It takes a lot of additional staff work, but it also confuses the public if the fees change midstream. So um, we are looking to implement new fees effective uh, April 1st. Um, in many areas, it standardizes clinics and camps. I will run you through what the fee changes are. They're kind of set up in groups. Um, 
the to staff look to keep the fee increases small where um, it would just you be used to standardize fees for similar clinics and camps this was thought to be a marketing tool so when a a parent comes in and they say a selection of perhaps eight different camps that are offered the same times, uh, same amount of time, same type of uh, uh, instruction level, that all of those fees would be nearly the same. It would be kind of a smorgasbord of, of offerings. Um, we also look to increase uh, fees for our higher end camps, the camps that are not only have a higher quality instruction, they are more advanced skill level and they are more expensive because of program equipment and supplies. Currently our junior counselor program is about $60 or $80 if you're not a resident. And um, the junior counselor takes the place of a participant in a program like Nature Camp or Aqua Camp. And those programs were charging about, it, you'll see it, around $290 for those programs. So instead of uh, giving them a discounted spot, um, one of the ways we, ways we know we can raise revenues is that we have uh, fill those, uh, per, those spots with fully paying participants. And the, the, we may end up with less junior counselors, but um, we are planning on adding junior counselors to our summer drop-in program so that they, there's still an opportunity for them to get community service. But um, we do feel that the junior counselor is receiving the same benefits as the other participants in many camps. So we're looking at um, charging them full price or else the space will be offered to a participant at full price. Uh, we also, the monthly parking fees at the Davis Center uh, have, are not going as we had planned. As you know, the uh, kitty corner from the Davis uh, Teen Center and the Davis Center parking lot, the Vaughn's parking lot, uh, the Vaughn's closed, and now that parking lot is being used for daily parking and monthly parking. So we, at this time, have about 30, or excuse me, three paid monthly users of our lot that was supposed to be about 26 monthly users. So we're dropping the fee there to encourage more users to pay monthly parking fees. And then also, um, there are many programs that, um, that well, not many, there's a few programs that we're proposing that to offset, um, that have new net revenue, and we're using those programs to help offset some of the lost revenue in some other less popular programs. So I'll um, just going to go through, whoops, sorry, stop. Um, I tried to group these kind of in the areas that we're talking about. So um, to begin with, these are the more higher end fees. Um, we did want to standardize the price between Nature Camp and Aqua Camp. They are offered the same amount of time. They have the same types of excursions. They have the same types of expenses. So the fee for Aqua Camp is moving up 8%, but as Nature Camp, it's less than 1%. So the fee together is uh, $296 for two weeks, uh, 40 hours a week. So pretty, um, it's, it's a great camp. You get a lot. You get a lot for your money. Um, junior lifeguards, very popular program. Never have problems filling. Almost have too many kids. Uh, so that that fee we know is very reasonable for the amount of time. It's a seven-week program, two and a half hours a day. Um, that that fee is going up eight percent as well, or twenty-five dollars. The Junior Lifeguard Little Nippers program, it's a shorter one-week course. Give people a taste of the Junior Lifeguard program for those that may not want to spend the whole summer doing Junior Lifeguards or have that commitment. So that's going up $10. Uh, we're introducing in a new turf and surf camp. This is a one-week camp. Um, not uh, Similar to our old sports and beach camp that hadn't been quite as well uh, not as much participation as we wanted. We're adding a lot of new activities to it, outrigger canoeing, kayaking, sailing, um, uh, surfing, and then some of the other, you know, bowling and indoor sports too that cost a little bit more. It'll be a full day, one week camp. So you can see it's kind of in the same line as our other 
two-week camps, but for only one week. So we're introducing that as new. And then last year, um, our Engineering with Legos camp, it is a half-day camp. We're expanding the number of offerings we had. We had waiting lists on all of our camp dates. Um, it is a half-day, one-week camp, but there is so much equipment involved, and literally they bring bins and bins of Legos in. <laughs> Um, and so we're increasing that that fee. Uh, we do find feel it's you know a fairly high end camp, but we're not seeing any decline in participation because the the price. So that's the high, somewhat the higher end camps. Oh, geez, what? I need to do this differently. Um, some of the fee changes that are to standardize camps and the camp fees. Um, as you see here, the, the fee last year, um, kind of a little bit all over the place. Um, we are moving everything up to 135. Most of these camps have good participation. Some of the ones that had lower participation were like doggone fun. It's a contractor that runs the program. He felt that, you know, reduce the price and I'm going to get more people. It would only probably take two extra participants to make up for the 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 decrease in the revenue that he's uh, proposing here. So we're also adding a new high performance and advanced tennis class uh, clinic. It's a half day camp. Um, the coast to coast soccer, there's a lot of competition with soccer out there. So we're trying to standardize it with some of our other programs. And um, advanced beach volleyball, again, $135. It's an advanced class. Um, so we, we plan on offering, you know, these eight camps together. You can go for a half a day for one week and um, get good instruction, get, have great equipment, have good, good staff or contractors running the programs. Okay, so the, these are all half day, one week. week. Um, then there are two, the first two there, Club West Running and Beach Volleyball Clinic. Uh, those we're trying to standardize together. They are very low cost equipment wise. Um, the ratio of instructor to participant is fairly high. So th those are a little bit less expensive than the other um, standardized camps as you saw. So they're going for 115. And then we're taking, doing marginal increases um, for swimming lessons, tennis lessons, um, you know, five and six percent. They haven't been raised in two years. These are within what fees are being charged in other community by other community organizations. We also are proposing an increase for the daily tennis permits to six dollars, a one dollar increase. It hasn't been increased, I think, in three years. Um, and then, as you see, the Davis Center monthly parking permits going from $140 per month down to 75 So that's an, a decrease. Oops. Let's get off of that. Oh. So um, staff did, you know, tried to look at all the fees, uh, stand, use small increases to standardize uh, fees where they could, proposed larger increases to increase revenue in highly successful programs. And then in some programs where we're not seeing the participation, we reduce the fees um, to try and attract more participation, and then the volume of revenue would be improved. Market surveys. Nancy saying market surveys. As always, and we do look to our competitors to find out where they stand with um, their fees and what they're exactly offering. Um, so each year we, we not only survey parents to find out if we're at a spot where we are affordable, um, changes that they would want to see, but we're also looking to other agencies to make sure we're not duplicating what they're doing. If they have a better program, then we may decline to have one. If we have a, you know, or we'd look for niches where we can have a program. But we do um, try to balance where we are with our pricing in the market so that we are, um, do attract clients and we're, you know, competitive with the other, other agencies out there that are providing programs. So, um, 
We're looking to the Park and Recreation Commission to support and approve this mid-cycle fee increase. We would then need to take it to City Council for approval. There will be other fees proposed in the fiscal year uh, 2011 budget that may not have hit this list because they're more year-round fees. Um, we're going to, of course, again, look at our uh, facility rental fees our fitness and dance fees, some of the many other contracted programs. So there may be other fees proposed, but those would be implemented in September of this year. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do have one suggestion uh, when this goes forward to council, and that would be to include the length of the camps. It looks like, you know, if you're not familiar with it, you think 296 what a week, you know, or how much are we charging? So it might just have better clarification the length. That's a great camp. idea. Um, are there questions of staff regarding these changes? Yes, Mr. Burns. Yeah, and something you might also bring up to council is once this is done, how much of an increase in revenue are we going to expect, or do you know that now? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Burns. We don't really think we will see a vast increase of revenue above the shortcomings that we are, are, ha are proposing or that have also, during the August reductions, we had proposed some fee increases such as to junior guards and the junior counselor program. Those were already added into the budget. We're coming back to you now for those fee approvals, though the budget appropriations were already put in place. So we don't, we think we're going to be able to balance our budget. We're confident of that, but we, we don't expect to exceed our revenue commitment by making this change. A, a, a clarification. We will generate additional revenue by these changes, but we've had reductions in our, we haven't realized, we don't expect to realize all of the revenues that are already budgeted. So. We should expect a balance at year end, but we will definitely be generating additional revenue with these fee increases. Yeah, I, I guess what my my question was in the report, it's saying uh, the recreation department is going to be down one hundred and sixty thousand dollars below budget. I, I wasn't expecting you to say that these uh, are going to raise one hundred and sixty thousand dollars, but are they going to raise seven thousand, twelve thousand, fifteen? So that we're working, we are at. working on the numbers. Our challenge is that this, you know, we already, as, as Ms. Hannah said, we've already budgeted some of this money when we made the uh, changes to our budget in, in August. So, yes, we hear the, uh, the suggestion that we actually put a number in there, so we'll... Yeah, I mean, to put we'll it into for City Council. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Other question? Mr. Casebeer. I'm just curious with these um, fee increases for these programs, is, are there provisions for scholarships for needy kids for any of these programs? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Casebeer, yes, there are. Um, we typically, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but last year we gave about $26,000 in scholarships. This year, as part of our August reductions, we are proposing to cut that amount in half, but make up the difference through grant funding to raise funds for scholarships. In the past, our scholarship, we didn't really have a scholarship fund. We haven't had that. What we do is forgive fees mm -hmm. to, to fill up our, um, to attract scholarship clients. Um, so this year, we're proposing we're going to cut it in half about how many free spaces we give away and raise the other half, you know, about $12,000 in scholarship funds. And that's being worked on by Judith uh, McCaffrey, our other recreation manager who does the f is working on the fundraising elements. So we, to answer your question, we plan on having the same number of scholarships. And I can get back to you with the exact number that is that we're proposing. Good. I applaud you in providing these programs. Okay. Mr. Lamar Hall. Um, junior counselors. Um, when I was a junior counselor for various camps, I provided a service to the camp, did stuff, 
for the younger campers. Um, they, I'm not super comfortable with the idea of charging full freight to folks who are helping to make the camp happen and providing a service, even if they're young. Um, can you sort of talk me through both the sort of like revenue recovery piece? Are we really talking about a lot of money? Um, and uh, and what the discussion was among staff about, um, you know, whether this would turn a, turn folks away from an opportunity to learn leadership skills, to learn responsibility, et cetera. Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Laramore Hall. Um, we did talk about this at length. Um, uh, to begin with, I guess, it's about $13,000 that we're giving away in, to junior counselors annually in programs. Um, we do value junior counselors' help in things like Nature Camp and Aqua Camp. Um, it is a learning experience for uh, a junior counselor. We do a lot of training with them um, ahead of time, talking about appropriate behaviors and such. Sometimes um, we have good junior counselors, and then we have junior counselors that are placed there because their parents don't know where to put them, right? So we get kind of a mix of really great junior counselors and some not so great, and that was part of the overall discussion. Some of the supervisors um, that oversee these programs, you know, they came from being a junior counselor, such as you're talking about, and, and, it, it, was, and it is a pathway to a recreation career to a certain extent. But it is ex an expensive seat on the bus for us to um, exchange a non-paying participant or a partially paying participant for someone that is fully paying. And frequently the, the programs that the junior counselors are in, there's waiting lists for kids that want to get in. So we do have mixed feelings about it, and I do acknowledge what you're saying, and that's why we've talked about expanding um, the junior counselor program to the summer drop-in um, sites, of which there are 200, upwards of 200 kids attending per day, and we can really use the extra help. It's not quite the same experience. It's a little bit harder work and a little bit less fun, um, but we did see this as an opportunity to um, you know, allow, have community service, but um, also we're in a bind where we have to make revenue and, you know, that <laughs> if we're going to continue to offer programs, we have to bring up that end of it. Is it possible to cut the number of junior counselors that we have in the camp in order to save some of this money and, and, and rely on quality rather than quantity? It's, po it's possible, such as scholarships, to, you know, m mitigate, maybe not cutting them as much. Like, Nature Camp has five junior counselors, and that's a lot. And, you know, that, that is a possibility. I, I think, though, the other thing that you're saying is, is re and really, you can't screen a junior counselor so much. You might be able to, but... How are, are we going to have a hiring criteria for them? I mean, that's a whole other thing that um, I, I think that's an expense that at this particular time we might look at in the future, but I, I would think it would be a bit difficult to implement with kids that age, and I, I wouldn't want to put that burden on staff. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, just to add another component to this, we do have scholarships available. Parents of junior counselors are just as welcome to apply for scholarships. But I believe that it is also true that a majority of parents of junior counselors are paying for their kids to attend activities throughout the summer and other programs. And, you know, so I think, again, we shouldn't price something based on um, what what might be a negative for a few, but instead provide the scholarship opportunities that apply um, and, um, and, and feel comfortable in the service that we're providing. 
this is not something that we we are doing, you know, jumping right ahead. I mean, we, as Ms. Hanna said, you know, we talked about it and really debated it back and forth because we're really proud of our junior counselor program. But by the same token, we are providing child care, if you will, for the junior counselors over that period of time. Um, and they are having all the benefits of being engaged in the camp and the activities and the additional training by the same token they are providing a service back to the program so we realize the intricacies of that but i think um you know setting the fee and we have scholarship opportunities i think that helps to get to um if somebody really wants to do it and um and then pursuing those opportunities to have assistance with the fee no. Thank you. Kind of the thinking of where we, how we got there. Well, yeah, I think all of us are, um, it's hard. And we appreciate what you've gone through to, to come to this. Um, personally, I like that idea of uh, unifying the camp costs so that when a parent is looking at different camps, um, they might overlook one that maybe was priced lower thinking it wasn't as good a camp or whatever when they're all good camps and um, may also be more inclined if one is full to go to another one so I think that you know that's better marketing um, and uh, it's interesting that we're doing it just a little bit for the uh, new commissioners this time of year as we go through the budget um, we're usually very theoretical because we will not see the budget until council has seen it first. So all we're dealing with now is theory and no hard numbers. So including when we meet on Monday, we'll be going over concepts and I, you know, what, where we want to go, but no hard numbers. So um, to see hard numbers this time of year is different. Um, are th yes. Yes, I I just like to to say I I know times are tough and um, you know with all the the budget cuts etc. I I just like to say I think it's very exciting to see two new programs on on this the the turf and surf camp sounds great and and the high performance tennis clinic I just think that's wonderful. Okay, great. Um, well, do we are we ready for a motion or? On this? Well, you know, since I said nothing at all, I'll, I'll make the motion that we have, we approve the uh, changes as uh, provided to us by staff. I'll second it. Okay. And um, I think, you know, the comments that to go forward are that we are, um, uh, at least for me, as, as I am pleased to see the flexibility to be able to recover revenue earlier this year in this stressful time. So um, I'm glad that we're looking at um, more creative ways. We're not just stuck in our old paradigm. So, okay. With that, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. One abstention. One abstention. Did not pass unanimously. Okay. And that brings us to Parma Park Restoration Status Report. Welcome. Good evening, Commissioners. Jill Zachary, Assistant Parks and Recreation Director. I'm going to provide a short introduction and then turn the presentation over to Kathy Fry. Uh, Kathy, as many of you know, is our Associate Planner, and she works on a variety of park planning, front country trails, beach issues. Uh, she has been working at Parma Park a quarter of her time for the last eight months. Uh, Santos Escobar, our parks manager, is here, and he manages our park system, and he's been very involved in the work that we've been doing at Parma. And I'd just like to give you um, a, a brief introduction, um, because this is an item that is also going to the city council next Tuesday. Um, one of the things that, one of the great things about Parma Park, besides its open spaces, 
um, and its location within Santa Barbara and its use as a hiking uh, an equestrian facility is that we are the beneficiaries of the Parma Park Trust and the trust uh, provides funds to the department on an annual basis for maintenance of the park and that allows us to hire outside assistance. We provide um, in-kind support <coughs> through our park staff that manage it uh, but to hire outside assistance for trail management for defensible space as it's in a fire prone <laughs> area and we're going to talk about the impacts of the T fire and then also to develop capital projects and the reason really why we're here today to talk about this restoration project is we met with our trustee soon after the fire and we asked him to consider a two and a half year restoration plan program for the park and he agreed to that and that's allowed us to focus a whole series of resources at the park partly the trust funds and then also our because we have that trust uh, and those funds we were able to leverage other funds so you'll see you'll see in your staff report and we won't talk a lot much about the numbers today but we were able to leverage uh, those funds with funds from FEMA and the State Office of Emergency Services and then also uh, a national emergency grant that we acquired which essentially was a, uh, a work grant, a jobs grant, where we were able to put people who are unemployed to work for six months. And so all of those things came together that allowed us to do something that, frankly, we can't do in any of our other open space parks and won't be able to do for a very long time. So today we really want to talk about something that's exciting, that's been successful. And at some point when you do uh, site visits, uh, we'll take you out on the trail at Parma Park. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy Fry. Good evening. Um, as Ms. Zachary stated, we uh, I'm going to be covering uh, some of the things that happen in the park that maybe were not expanded in your report, in the status report, but we'll expand a little more today, this evening, on uh, what occurred in the park during the fire and after the fire. Parma Park is approximately 200 acres in the Sycamore Creek watershed. And it is bounded on the south by Stanwood and on the north by Mountain, Mountain Drive. And it, it's very close to Los Padres National Forest. And because we have that large expanse of open space and the forest is so close, it provides very quality habitat for wildlife and a wildlife corridor between the city and the northeast boundary of the city and the forest. So it's a val very valuable piece of property as far as our natural resources in the city. We are, um, the park encompasses the 200 acres of which approximately 80% is native habitat. There are about 20% non-native exotic species within the park. The uh, T fire actually burnt 65% of uh, the Sycamore Creek watershed. And in this slide, the T fire is bounded by that red line. And the Sycamore Creek watershed is in blue. And Parma Park actually extends over two of the tributaries with, within Sycamore Creek and Coyote Creek. Uh, so the area that was burned actually burned about 95% of Parma Park, which is contained totally within those T fire boundaries. And to give you an idea of what that looks like at the park, we've got some before and after slides to show you um, just the devastation that occurred there. Um, when you went out to the park, you really couldn't see that 5% left. It really did look like 100% burned and maybe even more of that because some of the trees were actually burned below the root zone. So it was 
a very humbling experience to go out there afterwards. This is a view looking on the upper portion of Parma Park on the western part of the property around El Cielito Drive, looking out northwest, northeast across the property towards mountain and towards Los Padres National Forest. And as you can see, our native habitats were quite devastated. Uh, to give you an idea of the habitats that burned, we have oak woodland, scrub oak, which is quite rare in the city. Also another rare habitat, which is um, our native grassland in a habitat form, uh, chaparral and coastal sage scrub. And we also do have um, non-native uh, habitat, including a great amount of uh, non-native grasses within the park. And on our next slide, you'll see another rare habitat, which is riparian or creekside habitat that you would find along the Sycamore Creek uh, corridor or the Coyote Creek corridor. And you can see that both the overstory and the understory were burned in the tea fire. You can actually see a few of our crew in the slide to the right out there actually working. Um, in the next slide, you'll see our at one time lovely oak woodland which was a continuous canopy. Woodland is a definition that means that the canopy is continuous. At one time, um, that was a, a, in total shade, and that continuous canopy provides a very, um, very valuable resource to wildlife and also provides shade for um, uh, plant species that, on Parma Park, uh, there's not a lot of that habitat. There is a lot of open and chaparral area. So to have a shady portion, we totally lost that in the fire, uh, but just for a short time. We, I don't want to make this sound like doom and gloom. We are moving into better times up at Parma Park. Uh, immediately after the fire, staff went out into the field and we uh, went to assess the damage, to look for hazards, and to start to prepare a plan for the immediate um, restoration and, and to take care of Parma Park and also for a short-term and a long-term uh, plan for the park. Um, we knew right away that since this fire was in November, that we had a great potential for rain to come and flooding, not only within Sycamore Creek on the uh, park, but also downstream, which you saw the um, watershed continues from the headwaters near and in the park to all the way through the city down to the ocean. So uh, we wanted to get on the ground, and you see on the slide on the right, we went into immediate action to pull branches and trees that had fallen in the creek, pulled them out of the creek, and in cases where we could not haul them away or move them away, we cut them into boulder sizes within the creek. So if they were to move, they would not clog um, the downstream area. Our number one concern were hazards and safety within the park. And on the left, you can see our eucalyptus grove, which was totally burnt within uh, the park. And uh, the eucalyptus grove in the past had been managed under our vegetative fuels program. And they are non-native trees, and we always had a plan to remove those. It probably would have been phased uh, for their removal. After the fire, we realized they did present a, a hazard. They could fall. They, were, they are right along um, a roadway and major trail through the park. And uh, we realized that we had the potential to use FEMA funds for this disaster and decided that this was probably one of the prime uses of our FEMA funds here. Um, FEMA rules are very specific. You can only use FEMA funds for hazards, for safety issues. 
uh, and for infrastructure that's burned. They do not cover such items as restoration, like the replanting of natives, but we did have funds to remove these trees, and you can see the logs piled to the right on this slide here show where the trees were removed. And here is actually the grove after the trees have totally been brought down. And this is our national, our national emergency grant crew. Uh, not only did we use FEMA funds and our state office of uh, uh, emergency services funds, but we went to um, the Parma Trust, um, Mr. Thede, who is the trustee, and pre presented our plan to him, our immediate plan and our plans for the future, and uh, asked him to help us with funding for the restoration of the park. We went from a work plan within Parma Park to a restoration and rehabilitation plan and started on that immediately. FEMA was with our emergency response and then the Parma Trust came in for our next phase. And, the nat and at that same time uh, is when the National Emergency Grant came into effect. And that provided 11 temporary staff for six months. So they worked from June until just this past December of 2009 to help uh, with the restoration and the rehabilitation of the park. Uh, you can see here that the eucalyptus stumps were already sprouting again after they were removed. FEMA does not pay for the removal of stumps. So we would have had another eucalyptus grove eucalyptus grow very fast, so we would have had another grove, but um, luckily we had the Parma Trust be able to fund the removal through stump grinding, which is also under our um, integrated pest management uh, program, uh, not removed with pesticides. This was done manually. Also, we had the National Emergency Grant crew, the NEG crew, go in and rake up the eucalyptus nuts or seeds, we were alerted that because of the fire, it burnt off the coating of the seeds and they would have the chance to re-sprout here. Now they've got an open canopy and we've got ash that's fertilizer and seeds that are ready to go. So they actually raked that whole grove. We had the contract staff, uh, we could have used contract contract staff, which would have been very expensive, but we had our grant crew who could go in and do this, which is very labor intensive. Um, some of the work that um, FEMA covered was, um, once again, the grove removal, brushing in Coyote Creek. Uh, of the infrastructure, there's not a lot of in infrastructure up at Parma. We did lose a light pole in standard, and that was replaced. Uh, we moved from our immediate response to our restoration and re rehabilitation portion as we moved on in months. And as our plant material started to grow back in the spring, um, our trails needed uh, work. They needed rehabilitation. And the NEG crew was there and available to come in and um, restore the trails and keep them in shape which we normally do approximately twice a year. They were able to help us with that. And uh, you can see on the left here uh, and the right, the before and after of uh, one of our trails that uh, did need a lot of work and that was all done by the NEG crew. Um, when the fire went through Parma Park and burned off uh, our vegetation, especially the chaparral and the coastal um, sage scrub. It was very dense. You could not walk through those areas. And it exposed some hazards that we weren't aware were even in there in some instances. We could see barbed wire. It was usually in an area that was outside of where people were walking as people stayed on trails. But we did find tea posts and pipe and all kinds of metal objects that were in there. And generally, people and horses stay on the trail, but we realized this opportunity and we realized they could present a hazard, so we did go in and the NEG crew once again 
through that grant, uh, we were able to have the labor to go in and remove pounds and pounds, maybe even tons of tons of metal out of the park. Um, another hazard where it may not be a hazard to humans, but could be a hazard to our natural habitats there, our native habitats, our non-native exotic species. That's very labor intensive if you don't use pesticides, if you go in and you use manual means, which we do at Parma Park. We had the crew to go in and clean those up. And you can see um, castor bean here on the slide on the right. And uh, we tried to time our cleanup with the blooming season and the seeding season. So we got these plants before they actually seeded and then had another cohort cohort, another year of seeds on the ground. So we did a little preventative work with that. Unfortunately, we still do have a lot of seeds in the seed bank on the soil up there. So we'll be continuing to do that work in the future. Um, we, we consulted with Craig Michaela of the Santa Barbara Olive Company and there was a very special and still is a very special resource at Parma Park and that is a 100 year old olive grove that was planted by the Parma family in the late 1800s. Um, and that grove has been in existence at the park. It is an exotic plant, but it does have um, a cultural um, background to it for the park. We've left it in existence. We've left it in a, a grove structure. That grove experienced the fire, but did leave standing wood. And we realized that we had a very valuable and historic resource there with the olive wood. It has a very beautiful grain and color to it. And we decided to try to salvage that wood. And uh, with the help of uh, Mr. Michaela, he helped us, he helped us pull our plan together um, for how we were going to proceed with both the salvage of the wood and moving forward with the olive grove. Um, we also consulted with Dr. Robert Muller from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Um, he is a fire ecologist, and um, he told us that it was essential to uh, make sure that we kept after the non-native species uh, uh, in Parma Park, because now we have the open ground, and if we weren't able to get in there and remove our non-natives, that we could possibly um, um, lose some of our native habits, habitats in there. Um, so the parks division already had a sign plan in place that we had talked about doing possibly in the next year. And uh, that was in place prior to the fire. We already knew that we wanted a rustic sign because that is the feeling and the flavor of Parma Park. And we had already decided we wanted a routed sign and we were going to put those uh, signs in place at the five, in the five miles of uh, trails at Parma Park. So we contacted a local woodworker with a mill and talked to him and he said, by all means, this was very valuable and would be able to be milled for the signs with the size of the wood that we had. And uh, we also realized that we would be able to create some benches and picnic tables for the park. And I have a sample of the sign here. Um, and we actually decided to leave the burnt edges of the of the wood on the branches because it actually is a, 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 a piece of history actually. Besides having the wood, we also have evidence of the fire on that. And so when people walk up to the park, uh, on the slide on your right, you'll see uh, our National Emergency Grant crew uh, installing those signs at the park, and there are, there's one of the signs on the left which is already there. We completed that uh, with um, their labor. We had our woodwork, the woodworker um, prepare those signs, 
and the, and the Parma Family Trust paid for that. And then the grant crew um, actually installed the signs uh, on the park. Uh, Mr. Michaela uh, from the Santa Barbara Olive Company was very instrumental in helping us rebuild, uh, pre prepare the plan for the rehabilitation of the trees. And we realized that we did not have to replant that grove, that the grove itself would actually heal itself. And you can see on the right, uh, within a few months, we had uh, so many sprouts coming up from the stumps even before the trees were brought down, even before we cut the top of the wood off, they were already re-sprouting. So uh, Mr. Michaela came in and helped uh, the crew. They ac he actually trained the crew on how to do this work. And um, a few main sprouts, a few leaders were selected, and then the crew came in and pruned the rest. That was a lot of work for over 40 trees. They also um, cleaned up suckers that occurred in between the trees because once you lose that upper structure, the grove starts to push out new shrubs or trees in between. So there was a lot of groundwork there also to do. So um, we now have an ongoing restoration and rehab rehabilitation project for those olive trees. We will need to continue to work on that and to um, guide and train those leaders and <laughs> keep back some of the suckers that form on the side. So we have moved on in our rehabilitation and restoration plan. We are currently in that phase. We talked about a two and a half year plan with the trustee. We've gone through one year. We're on our second year. We're probably looking at at least five years for the park to maybe resemble what you know of it from the past. Um, the olive grove will probably take about 10 years to become trees again, to move from a shrub form to a tree form. Um, for our for our oak trees, which there is an example on the right of one of our oak trees coming back after the fire, the re-sprouting, we've learned that it may take up to three years to determine whether our trees are actually, which ones are going to survive of our oak trees. So looking into the future, we'll continue to monitor, to watch these and make sure that our non-native habitats are sought after aggressively, that we will tackle them aggressively so they don't take over our native habitats. Uh, we will um, do some active restoration and that we have been collecting. We've had a contractor collecting native seeds on Parma Park. We've done that as kind of our insurance policy in the event that one of the habitats did not um, come forward, maybe not survive, or maybe not as uh, strongly as we had expected. Uh, we have seeds from all of our habitats. We're going to be sowing some of those seeds this coming month in another week or two. They'll be grown out in the nursery, and this fall we plan on having um, a restoration day, a planting day. We're going to invite the public and have volunteers come and help us actually go into that eucalyptus area where the trees were removed, and we'll be restoring that. Those are actually headwaters in Sycamore Creek, so we'll try to replace that non-native habitat area with a native oak woodland and understory and extend that habitat in there. And um, in closing, I would like to thank the Parma Family Trust for all of their support during this trying time that we've had. Um, their, um, their support uh, also uh, through Gerald Thede, the trustee. And um, thank you. That's our closing for this evening for the Parma status report. Thank you very much. It's um, I went up there with uh, Santos a week after the fire and it had just we had that rain and <coughs> things were sprouting already it was pretty amazing I'm sure it was the non-natives that you didn't want that were sprouting but <laughs> it, it it is amazing to watch how fast things want to heal how the earth wants to heal but um, that's very and thank God for the
Karma Trust, I'll tell you. Are there questions of Ms. Fryer, Ms. Zachary, or Mr. Escobar? Not a question, just to thank you, and, and please, I'm sure I speak for the whole commission, but please thank all the staff, um, all the workers who have been um, doing such great work up there. Um, it was a horrible, horrible tragedy, um, but it is silver lining to see eucalypt eucalyptus stumps get ripped out of the earth and ground up. That always makes me happy. So. <laughs> Mr. Casebeer, did you? Um, this park, Parma Park, is a treasure, and I would hope that, um, I think it's kind of an unknown treasure, and maybe would there be some kind of public event where we would, or that we could have a grand opening and bring people and show them the kinds of things um, that to improve the ecology and the environment might uh, Commissioner Longstreet, or uh, Chair Longstreet, Commissioner Casebeer, I think that is a wonderful idea and it may be something we can explore with our restoration project with our volunteers. I'd love to participate with that. I'll put you on the mailing yeah. list. <laughs> Mr. Burns. Yeah, I, I hope that we uh, could come up with possibly a uh, a public recognition for uh, Craig and Cindy Michaela for what they've they've done because it's just amazing they've got that great expertise and they're if this in 10 years 15 years at the Oak Grove is excuse me the Olive Grove is so good that's that's amazing because it's you know it's it's also a treasure thank you that's a good idea for one of maybe our community service awards no other comments? Um, thank you so much. And uh, please put, I think, all of us on the mailing list for the, the planting day so we'll be aware of it. And um, g give us an update, too, on the DFP. It is the 30th, the planting day. And just... Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> we January. have a community planting day uh, for this Saturday. Um, we think the rain is going to stay back so we can actually do this. We have about 800 native plants that we will be installing. We have a little bit of weeding to do first, but um, it should be a wonderful, beautiful day. Uh, it starts at 9 a.m. We're going to work from 9 until noon. Um, if you can make it, we'd love to see you out there. And the ground will be soft to get those weeds out, so it'll be a good day. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Mr. Casebeer? Is there a chance that that could get on to Ed Hat or um, public um, blogs? Chair Longstreet, Commissioner Casebeer, it should have gone on there. I can double check, but we do send out press and there, the online media as well as the print media and, and other media pick things up and sometimes they're too busy, but we'll double check that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and that brings us to item 10, which is the budget. I think we will probably not have a discussion tonight because we have a meeting on Monday. Chair um, Longstreet, I just do have a couple of things okay. that I want to, um, to uh, mention to you so that we can uh, maybe have some final dates uh, by the Monday work session. Um, the... Um, Ms. McGill put together um, a list for you of Parks and Recreation Commission meetings for 2010. This is something that we're going to update on a regular basis, um, but particularly I think for the Commission between now and when the budget is adopted, um, and we've, you've had three budget work sessions um, since August. Uh, we have another one on Monday. So. Um, we wanted to at least have your commitments all in one place so that you could kind of see how things are flowing. I wanted to just talk about um, how the budget will be presented and, and give you some dates and, and as you're looking at your calendars, talk about why the timing is so critical. With seven commissioners, it's going to be very difficult to find dates that work for all of you. And so we really um, have some limitations on timing. So I wanted to talk through those. Um, the uh, city council will receive the budget from the city administrator on Tuesday, April 20th. 
in that week, um, and we are proposing some dates for the commission, uh, April 19th, which is the day before the, the council gets the budget, the 21st or the 22nd, we are proposing to have a special work session with the commission uh, where we will uh, present the parks and recreation budget. Uh, typically, this is a meeting that is held in our conference room, allows for a little more um, uh, open discussion, questions and answers, especially with new council members. And then at your um, April, a formal, your April meeting, Am I not even see? I think think it's not on here. At your April meeting, we will do the formal presentation. So some of it will be a repeat for you, but for the public, that will be our uh, presentation of the budget. Um, going back to the week of April 19th, the the staff are recommending two additional budget presentations. Um, one is doing a presentation to the joint meeting of the neighborhood um, advisory committees. Um, and second, do a presentation to the youth council. Um, and uh, we thought, you know, based on their experience last year and, and their desire to be more engaged and have a full understanding, we would do those right up front. The... Um, we are proposing to have a uh, special meeting. It says special work session, but it would be a special meeting of the um, Park and Recreation Commission on Wednesday, May 19th. This is the meeting where, um, the city, the, where the Park and Recreation Commission would develop their recommendations on the budget to the City Council. Please note that that is one week earlier than your regular meeting. The primary reason for that is a, a challenge in my schedule. And so I'm asking that we move that up a week so that um, that, that will work. I'm sorry, um, the, would that replace the regular meeting for that month? That is an option for the commission. And that is something that staff talked about as well. Since there would be no budget issues discussed on at the regular May meeting, we have talked about maybe doing a very brief meeting. Um, uh, we would likely have tree issues. So that is something that we will be looking at. Um, and, and also then, separate from that, I wanted to give you um, the date that the department will be presenting our budget at City Council, um, which is uh, Thursday, May 13th at 6 p.m. So again, the two formal presentations of our budget will be at the April 28th commission meeting and the May 13th special budget meeting with the City Council. Um, so, given that, I would like to ask that commissioners look at their schedule and try to the best of their abilities to make these dates work. It will be, I think, very important to have the greatest number of commissioners, if not all commissioners, available at the meeting where the recommendations are um, developed for the commission, understanding that this is going to be an extremely difficult budget this year. So uh, I wanted to just um, go over that with you. And then I just wanted very quickly, oh, I'm sorry, um, Chair Longstreet, Commissioner Burns. Question, just maybe we can get resolved. Uh, we, we've got written down April 19th, 21st or 22nd for a meeting. And then you've also said that the budget, city council gets the budget on the 19th. On the 20th. On the, 20, on the 20th. So having a meeting on the 19th would... I'd rather we have the meeting on the 21st or the 22nd, and if, could, if we could make that decision today, that would be great. Um, having it on the Monday is an option for the commission, um, even though the budget officially goes to the council on that next Tuesday. So it can accommodate commissioner schedules. It's, it's really a matter of commissioner schedules. So which of those three dates we can get more commissioners? And um, 
This evening, uh, Ms. McGill has um, packets for you if you haven't already received it. It's packets of material. Like we lost electricity. Um, <laughs> for um, the Monday evening work session. Um, and included in that is a, a staff report uh, that's an overview. We're talking about cost recovery policies, um, and you have seven sample policies from other communities. So um, we are asking you to read through those and, and try to get a feel for um, what you like about them, what you think they might or might not work for, for you as a decision maker related to budget and, and um, how you prioritize uh, general fund expense and all of that. So w the intent of the workshop on Monday is to become more knowledgeable about cost recovery policies and to talk about what we like or don't like and whether or not we want to have a policy like that for Santa Barbara. And that's really the goal of Monday. Okay, that's good. Um, back to the 19th, 20th, 22nd, isn't are those our dates? 21st, 19th, 21st, 22nd. Have, who, have you heard from most of us? Okay. Okay. So that we have them both here captive, if they can look at their calendars. Night twentieth or twenty twenty first or twenty second. Either one. For the, the twenty the twenty second is much better. Okay. Is twenty second work for everyone here? Twenty second, April twenty second. Okay, then, and, and I am just going to say that with these meetings and, and seven schedules, we are going to go with the majority. Um, if we have five commissioners on any given day, then we will have to go with that date. And we're not going to drive Ms. McGill crazy. That's a, that's a rule. I might. A, a rule of the chair. <laughs> well, any more crazy then. <laughs> Okay, so we have our Monday night and Monday, our Monday night packet here oh, in oh, your oh. hand. Yeah. <laughs> Any more, Miss Rapp? Uh, that's it. Okay. And with um, perhaps a recommendation um, that the uh, neighborhood and outreach services item, uh, Miss Hannah has offered to um, email the um, update on various programs and activities to the commission okay. uh, since it was really just for information. Um, and um, so if the commission would like to do that in light of the hour. Uh, yeah. Okay. That, that sounds good. Thank you very much for that. Um, and like I said with the budget, you know, uh, we get it after council and then we'll move. We have to move rather quickly past that time. So with that, I think that closes our meeting we're done with our business so i'll move to for an adjournment so moved second okay all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed <laughs>